Hello and welcome to 3ABN Live. We are so excited tonight because we know that this is going to be a program that is not only inspirational, mm. but it is going to be very educational. And this is the type of program for which you want to grab a pen and paper, right, oh, yes. C.A.? very much so. I'm Shelley Quinn, and it's my privilege to be co-hosting tonight with C.A. Murray, our are what we call you a production manager. Production is what man. you're, I think I go by that title. That's a good title. <laughs> Guilty as charged. You know, there's something that I have found in my own life is that when I consider divine love, it is just beyond my imagination to think about the love of God. Mm. And the more I study it, the more I realize how little I know. But tonight we're going to be talking about the divine triunity yes. of God. Yes. The Trinity is a word that is sometimes used, and that is going to be a topic that's going to be well covered by our special guest, Dr. Ronko Stefanovic. See, you want to introduce Dr. Stefanovic? We are very, very pleased to have someone who has spent time in scholarship, in study, in learning, and he brings a wealth of information. And Shelley, may I say, as he, uh, we get ready to introduce him, he's, this is a neat guy. Amen. He's a, he's a humble man, a man of learning, but very, very approachable. Yes. And uh, we are very, very pleased to have the good doctor with us now. Doctor, if you come on out, we are pleased as we can be to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. You know, the very first, I'll never forget the first time I talked with this gentleman. And, you know, Ronco, no matter what we do, we always pray together, don't we? Anytime we're talking, we're praying together. That's and all what we have. <laughs> that is. But he is, you impressed me so much. And we bonded immediately, it yeah. seems that. I really enjoy your personality. I enjoy your enthusiasm, your zeal for God. And we're so glad that you're here tonight. And it's a great pleasure to come to know you I have fallen in love with all of you here. It's, it's, it's a great, great privilege to be with you. Here. Well, the, the feeling is, is mutual. And um, uh, we, can, we can let out, Shelley, I think. Um, one of those 15 programs that you were telling us about last year that are being taped this year, uh, Dr. Uh, Ranko Stefanovic is uh, the host, along with uh, Glenn Russell, of uh, a segment of Books of the Book that is coming up fairly soon that we are yes. most excited about. And so this is kind of a kickoff. You get to know a little bit about him as a person tonight uh, before we sit at his feet scholastically uh, in Books of the Book. And uh, we are very, very excited about the work that they did this week. And this, this guy's a trooper. He went through 26 programs in one week. That's I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> he really, was good. He really impressed but, the but, crew. But we, we really appreciate your company. So all of you made, made our taping so easy and enjoyable event. Yes. I, I cannot say it. It's and, and I think you've had enough Mexican food this weekend. Oh, it lasted yes. for a long time. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Lord, we don't have a lot of options here in Southern Illinois, you know, it's either Chinese or Mexican. Uh, or Chinese it, or, or Mexican. Or Chinese or Mexican. <laughs> biblical principle, one, one food a year, you know, it's... <laughs> well, tonight we are live and we are going to be putting Ranko on the hot seat in the second hour and taking some questions. If you have any questions, you can call us at 618-627-4651. Or you can email us at questions at 3abn.org. Actually, it's live. Live. I knew I was going to mess that up. <laughs> L-I-V-E at 3abn.org. L-I-V-E yeah. at 3abn.org. Yeah. And Shelley, this is a, a subject that has occasioned some amount of discussion. It is a current topic. There are questions in, in, in many minds about um, uh, the, the particular subject of the Trinity, the triune God. So we want to sort of wrestle with that tonight. And if you have any questions, we know there's some passion concerning the subject. Uh, send them in because we, we want to, to look into the subject objectively uh, as God has given us knowledge and wisdom to do so. And so if you hear something that you need light on or you have a question or a comment, please, in the second half, send, send them in even now, and uh, we'll try to get to those in the second half. We're going to sort of loose the doctor and let him go because he's got a lot to say, <laughs> and uh, uh, we want to get to it all. We want to unpackage his personal story, but before we do that, I think we'll go to some music. Okay. Uh, Shelley, if we can, uh, Margie Salcedo Rice came in just a little bit ago and uh, did some taping for us, and she's going to present now Holy, Holy, Holy. Perfect. Well, thank you, Margie. Indeed, God in three persons, 
Blessed Trinity, but what a mystery to try mm. to understand this. If you're just <laughs> joining us, I had mentioned at the top of the hour that divine love has no equal, and it is so hard to understand, but divine unity is even more difficult for our human mind to consider. But tonight we have Dr. Rankel Stevanovic with us, and he is going to help us to appreciate and understand this topic. Mm. I want to mention CA, we've got a live, this is a, a free offer for tonight, mm -hmm. and it is called A Simple and Easy Way to Study the Bible with Others. This is by Don and Marjorie Gray, and they were evangelists, and they've got proven Bible study techniques and a lot of expertise that went into this study guide. They've written a number of things, of Bible lessons and evangelistic scripts, so you can call us at 618 627-4651 to get this free offer or email us at freeoffer at 3abn.org. Mm -hmm. And this is a good one. Uh, there are so many people who say, I'm a little afraid of tackling a Bible study. This yes. kind of breaks it down and makes it very easy for you. And you'd be surprised that you can do that and you can do it well with this little book. We'd be glad to get it to you. Good doctor, we need to sort of let you go because we know you've got a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, when we deal with the Godhead, give us Godhead 101, as it were. Where do you start? How do you begin to tackle it? How do you get an understanding? Okay. We have to state several things bef before we are engaged in discussion about God. Number one, any talk about God brings us to the holy ground. Mm -hmm. Amen. Sometimes we are tempted to talk about God and, and in a funny way and without thinking what we are talking about. Mm. But in dealing with any subject related to God, we must show great reverence. Yes. Amen. Amen. And avoid any speculations. The second thing is that the being and the nature of God, it's a great mystery to us. Mm -hmm. See, with, with our small mind and brain, we are trying to grasp the infinity of God. Yes. One of the aspects of that mystery is that the Godhead consists of three divine beings that are united in purpose and activity, yet they are completely different and unique in their personality. And this concept for us as human beings, it's very, very difficult to understand mm -hmm. and, to, and, and to grasp. So this is our, our, our starting point. Another thing is we, we use the word Trinity. Yes, people observe it correctly that the word Trinity does not occur in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But much more, the concept is never explained in the Bible. You know, so many times when we study the Bible, people assume, let's open the Bible and try to see what the Bible says about that topic. Unfortunately, the Bible is not a systematic theology book. Uh -huh. yes. mm -hmm. There is no any, any subject that I'm interested in and say, let's go to that page, and from this page to, to that page, let's try to study the topic as we do with, with the, um, any, any theology book. Mm. Actually, when we study the book, we, we are picking up those different references, a text, trying to put them together, to systematize them, mm -hmm. and to get the answer. But the, the problem is that all those texts were stated within certain historical context. People had the problems, people had the issues, and God had to answer their questions. So we have only, only one aspect of that, of that, of the subject. But when we put all the, these texts together, mm -hmm. we get a little bit more complete, complete picture. So we, we have to keep these things in mind. So, when we are dealing with those Bible texts, we have to keep in mind that to one side, biblical references point clearly, clearly, and we will see it tonight, to the plurality of the Godhead in the, in the, in the Bible. In such a way, those texts, they make the evidences for the Trinity compelling. Mm. Amen. Now, you actually have been doing a number of camp meetings and 
You teach at Andrews. What is it that you teach at Andrews? Um, at Andrews, I teach New Testament courses. My specialty is the Old Testament, and also my second area is the Old Testament. So, biblical studies. I don't like dividing the Bible, you know, into two different subjects. I, I teach the Bible, but of course, my focus is on the book of Revelation. And can I say something? It's about 50% almost of the classes that I teach is about and the time events, and the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. and, and of the scriptures, what are there, 400 and something scriptures in Revelation, how many of those are Old Testament? <laughs> 300? 300. At least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, the Old Testament and the New Testament coincide. I mean, they, they just mesh perfectly and go together. And you have done a lot of study on this topic, which, which is what I wanted to bring. Yes. Your, uh, you have a THD. PhD. PhD. So, the good doctor is quite well versed in this topic mm -hmm. and quite the expert. So, now continue on, please. Yes. So, on one side, we have very clear text. On the other side, we have to admit that there are some confusing texts. Mm. And the problem is um, that I find that there are some people who try simply to focus on those problematic texts. Ah. And the conclusion they, re they reach, you see, the concept of the Trinity, it's foreign, foreign to the Bible. You see, if we want to understand any biblical doctrine, is we cannot go and to pick up two, three problematic texts. Can I say, you know, we can have a conversation, 20, 30 minutes, and that conversation, uh, maybe I talk to you, I can make two, three sentences that can be very confusing and problematic. Mm. If you take those problematic statements, you can say, you, you see, we don't know what he's talking about. But then you have those clear statements that I, that, that I make. So you try, in the light of those clear statements, to understand those maybe confusing or problematic statements that, I, that I'm making. Yeah, yeah. So you, you said something at the very outset that I think we need to sort of red flag, and that is when you're trying to understand a doctrinal point or set a doctrinal premise, take all of the evidence. All the evidence. Before, not just a couple, even good or bad, pro or con, take it all and then digest that and develop your, your doctrinal see, statement. Uh, let me, let me state something clearly. Can you imagine you have several hundred references that are clearly, clearly the indicator of the plurality of the Godhead in the Bible, and you have a few confusing texts, problematic texts. Is it right to take those few problematic texts to establish our view of what the Bible teaches about, about the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is not about the Trinity. Um, I know certain denominations where, where we go, it's about the doctrine of the Sabbath, about doctor, many, many doctrines of the Bible. They just take one, two, three, those vague texts, and they build their doctrine neglecting and overlooking those numerous texts yeah. that are so clear, telling us what really the teaching of the Bible is, is about. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, I've heard this uh, illustration used, and I like it, that if you're lining up 100 chairs and you've got 98 chairs that are in a perfect alignment and you've got two out here, some people will focus on those two chairs outside the line <laughs> and they try to build their yeah. doctrine on those two mm. to the exclusion of the 98 to say that there's not a line of chairs. So if, you, if you agree with me tonight, I would like that we focus on those clear texts. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. And I would like to invite our viewers, if they have a pen and pencil and paper, write those texts. And of course, we must admit, there are some vague texts in the Bible. It's not only about this, this uh, uh, topic, about other topics. Yes. I would suggest that in the light of these clear texts, then they take those problematic texts. Probably we will not have tonight a time. Maybe some viewers will ask some questions. We will deal with them. But then to take and try to understand those vague texts mm -hmm. in the light of those very, very clear texts. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. All right. So the question is that I would like to start the question. Is the idea of the three persons of the Godhead biblical? Right. And I'm sorry. I have to make a very clear statement that my research, my study of the Bible, and I know that you, reach, you have reached the same conclusion, the answer is yet. Now the viewers will ask the question, on which base? I would like to suggest that we go now through the Bible mm -hmm. and to see what the Absolutely. Bible says about that. Mm -hmm. I would like uh, to add something else. Um, 
we have these several nights, my good, my, my good friend, David Asherick, I did not know what he would be presenting. He did not know about this live program, but we are on the same, the same track. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we, just, we just met, we met two nights ago, we, we gathered together, we knelt down, and we prayed together to God, to, God, to, uh, to give us the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to, to study this topic together. I, I would like to encourage viewers to watch those evening programs for David Asherick. Is, Amen. Is, and when we when this Anchors of Truth was booked, we didn't know what David was going yes, to be doing, and we booked you in to talk on the Trinity. So here he is show, talking on the Trinity, and it shows, I believe it's God's timing to show that there are some concerns um, mm. among some people groups that they're anti-Trinitarians, and then there are those who are getting confused by what they're teaching. So I believe that God called you here tonight. He called David here to David has his this. own way to explain. I would never be able to do it. So God uses our, our talents Amen. so we complement each Amen. other. Amen. So I believe that the topic will become much clearer when we put everything together. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So shall we start with the Old Please. Testament? Oh, yes. I would like if, if the readers um, have their Bibles and, and it will be good that we hold our Bibles in our hands to go to the very beginning of the, of the, of the Bible. It's Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Sister Shelley, would you, would you read the first text? The, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So this is the first statement in the Bible where God is mentioned. Mm -hmm. We will notice here that the Bible does not try to prove the existence of God. Right. God exists. This is taken as a fact. Yes. And God created the heaven and earth. And I just want to tell you the divine nature of God and everything about God what we try to understand in the Bible is taken for granted. Amen. This is what the truth mm. is. We are struggling because with our limited mind, we are not able to grasp, to grasp the greatness of God. But now there are a few things I would like here to point. So please now you have to help me. We will put this text in Hebrew language because in this very first text of the Bible, we get the principle that stretches all up to the book of Revelation. No, the book of Revelation is my book. Amen. So I will always, always end with that. In Hebrew, it looks like this. Bereshit, bara Elohim. And here we have a sign that says that this is the first part of the sentence we have to stop here. So you notice it, Bereshit bara Elohim. How many words do we have? It means in the beginning created God. This is in Hebrew. In the beginning God created. How many words do we have? Three. Three. Then we go to the next part of the sentence is et ha shamim ve et ha aretz. Heaven and earth. How many words do we have? Now we have four. Actually, it is from this text we have the biblical principle that always, with reference to God, number three is associated. Mm -hmm. See, mm -hmm. three words, it, we have clear here division. But when we talk about human beings, when we talk about earth, it's always number four. Mm -hmm. When we go to the book of Revelation, to the rest of the Bible, you know, four angels on the four corners of the earth, yes. etc. Mm -hmm. It's always that principle. So it is from this text that we have number three. It's a holy number associated with the Godhead, but with reference to us as a human beings, to the entire earth, number four. Number four. It's, it's a symbol of that. Mm -hmm. But the word that is here used with, with reference to God, it's the word Elohim. Actually, the word for God, it's El. And that Im, that is in Hebrew language, it's equivalent to English S, which refers to the plural. So when ancient Hebrews refer to God as Elohim, if we really want to translate it into a literal way, it means gods. So it's a masculine plural. It's a, it's a plural. Mm -hmm. However, this is not a plural. This plural form expresses a singular form. See, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there is a strong emphasis on monotheism. Mm -hmm. And the Old Testament does not talk, does not, can I say, teach about the plurality of God for the same reason the people of Israel came out of Egypt. They were confronted with constant temptation of the surrounding pagan nations mm -hmm. that we have a polytheism. So there is always a strong emphasis on God and that he is one. one. If we go and take different books and, and commentaries, commentators who 
have a problem with the Trinity. They say, no, you see, this plural form, Elohim, it's a plurality of majesty. <laughs> the assumption is that in ancient times, in Semitic languages, when people refer to majesty, they use the plur plural form. Like the royal we. Uh, like, uh, mm -hmm. but, but this is a modern invention and construction. True. Amen. <laughs> I searched the Bible from the first page to the last page. There is never the expression when the person comes before the king and he called the king kings. Have you ever found that in the Bible? No. Yeah. Yeah. I, actually, there is no something like that in ancient Near East. Yes, we have in modern times in England and we have different parts of the world, but not at the time of the Bible. So the plurality of majesty does not work here. We don't want to say that the plurality of the divine name refers to the Trinity. But when we put all these statements together, then we get some strange things. Whenever the Bible refers to God, it's always, always in plural form. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that does make sense. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so, when we go to the so-called Shema, which is Deuteronomy 6.4, mm -hmm. we know that, the, uh, that text, Hear of Israel. I, I hope that the viewers will forgive me because I have to put into the fifth gear because we have so many texts. <laughs> they will have to go quickly through the Bible. In Deuteronomy 6.4 we have, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. He is one. It's very strange. When people read these texts, they say that they think that the text says the Lord is only one. Mm -hmm. The text says Elohim, which is plural, mm -hmm. is one. And it, may I say not, one, not one God, it's one. Yes, when, one when I first studied this out in the Bible, it actually says um, Yahweh, our Elohim, yes. is Echad, one. One. But that, that was so exciting to know that the word one there, it's a uni-plural word. It's representing several or numerous things that have become together as one. And that helped me. This scripture is what helped me understand the Trinity as I studied it out in the Hebrew language. Sister Shelley, when people read this text, they read, you know, the Lord is one God. But there is no noun after one. Precisely, yes. it has with one, yeah. And I, 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 yes. that kind of study I went through the Old Testament. Yeah. If you want to find the usage that it is only, there is always a noun that, that, that follows. Mm -hmm. that. By the way, the word um, echad, I know it's hard for you to echad. pronounce it, mm -hmm. people pronounce echad, it's echad. echad. Actually, it's the same word that is used in Genes Genesis 2.24. Mm -hmm. The man and the woman. They became one. man and woman, they became one, one flesh. So you have two, they become one. This is exactly the meaning of a had with reference to Elohim plurality, that he is one. So plurality is actually one. Does make sense? Hmm. But there is much more. Please, we cannot base just on one text. The entire doctrine is. It's, I would like us to go to few biblical texts that we have self identification of God okay. in the plural form. I'd like to go quickly to mention a few texts. The first one in Genesis 26 uh, and 27, uh, Sister Shelley, uh, or... Whoever's there first. Would, would, <laughs> Genesis would you read it? 26 Six. and 27? Yes. CA, are you Just there? Just 26 first. Oh, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Okay. So let us make man in oh, that's okay. our image according to our likeness. likeness. And so many times I meet people who said, no, you see, God had some heavenly council there, uh, consisting of some heavenly beings. They're making plans how to make uh, uh, him. Number one is, only God can make a man, crea create man. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Amen. There's no any council that God can ask them for permission on let us make it together. Yes. Only people who are equal or persons who are equal can make something. But then we go to verse 27. What do we have in verse 27? It says, an Elohim, let us make, an Elohim mm -hmm. made singular man in his image, mm -hmm. in the image of God made him. Do you see that in verse 26, from the plural form, as, our, etc., now we have 27 God makes, but everything is in singular, so that us refers really 
to God oh, and to mm -hmm. nobody, nobody else. If you have us, really you have more than one, one person. It refers to the plurality. Yes. But there is something more ob obvious. I would like to go to Genesis 3, 22, where we read, where after the entrance of sin, God says, the man has become as or like one of us, knowing good and evil. And again, I hear from some people, they say, you see, God was talking to angels there. Man has become as one of us. Mm. Praise the God. I believe always the scripture explains scripture. Yes. If we go to the previous text, okay, in verse 5, what do we read there? Let's notice parallel. The serpent says to Eve, For God, Elohim, knows that in the day you eat from the tree, you will be like Elohim, like God, knowing good and evil. And now, God said, you see, the man ate from the tree, and the man has become as one of us. Mm -hmm. do, do you see the parallel? Yes. Mm -hmm. In verse 5, you will become like God, knowing what is good and evil. Now, man ate, and the man has become as one of us. So that us parallels to Elohim in verse, in verse 5. Mm -hmm. Is that plurality? That's this, is so, this is so, so obvious. Another text I would like us to go to Genesis 11:7. Let us go down and therefore confuse their language. So the Lord, Elohim, scattered them abroad from there. Do you see that? Let us go down. Mm -hmm. People assume he's talking to the angel, but says the Lord came down. He confuses the languages. There is no reference that anybody else was. Elohim, Elohim did it. Yeah. So this is clear. When we compare these texts, we have a clear reference to the plurality of the, of the, of the Godhead. And please allow me, Another text is Isaiah 6, 8. And Isaiah had that vision of God. Yes. And then he heard God says, Who shall I send? Mm -hmm. And who will go for us? Yes. And Isaiah answers, Here am I send singular. Whom shall we send? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here am I send singular me, mm -hmm. you, singular, send me. So it's reference clear to the Godhead and to nobody else. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, okay, let's, let's just mention a few, few more other, other things. In the same chapter of Isaiah, we see that the heavenly angels there in the throne room, they're shouting to God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Why do angels shout three times holy? Why not two times? <laughs> Why not four times? It will be, it will be very normal. Okay. Another thing is, in number 6, 22 to 27, we have the threefold blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Now, let me, let me stop here for a moment. So we have three references to God. Of course, we can say this is just sheer speculation. Mm -hmm. But the next text. So they shall invoke my name. Yes. We have three names, but it's actually one name. The plurality of the, of the, of the Godhead. I'd like to stop at this moment. Because the time does not allow us to go through those numerous Old Testament references. But I'd like to ask the viewers one question. Of course, if we just take one text, we can say, this is just a coincidence, this is just what we found. But when we put all these references together, and then when we go to, to the rest of the Old Testament, to very similar text, is this just a coincidence? Mm -hmm. Whenever we have a reference to God, to the Godhead, it's always in the plural form. And this is the way how God identifies himself. Uh -huh. Amen. But I wish that I can say that in the Old Testament, everything is so clear. <laughs> By the way, if you really want to find out what the Bible teaches, we have to go to the New Testament. But our point is to, to say that the, the plurality of the Godhead is not foreign to the Old Testament. There is not so, 
a strong emphasis on that. There's no clear teaching because of the emphasis on monotheism, because polytheism was a constant temptation to the mm. people of Israel mm. in, the, in the Old Testament yeah. times. You wanted to say so, something? No, I, that's exactly the point I was going to make, is I think the emphasis on monotheistic teaching, teaching. was to put a barrier around them so that they would kind of come away from the polytheism that can, was... Yeah. Can, can we imagine if Moses stood in front of the people of Israel, tried to explain to them how there are three divine persons, etc.? Yeah, yeah. But isn't it interesting, given that overwhelming polytheistic milieu that they lived in, that when God chose to identify himself, and these have all been self-identification texts that you've read, that he chose to use that plural uh, identification of self, given the, the context in which he was explaining himself to them. So um, he, he, he wanted it to be understood that over and above their polytheistic bent or society, that he was indeed a triune singularity of, of God. And that, but that's in, in, in addition to them, wherever the plurality is used, and it's used regularly, always what follows, it's a singular form. Yes. yes. Yeah. But so know, plurality and singularity, it's always mixed. Mm -hmm. you, you cannot miss it. Yeah. There's no way, though, as I was studying this out for myself, I could not have understood what, I liked what you said, that if we want to understand the Old Testament, we have to look at the New, because the New is contained in the Old Testament, but the Old is explained in the New Testament. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So as, as I was studying all of this out, it, when it became clear to me is that that unity, that divine unity, which as we move into the New Testament we'll see, is that they are one in purpose and thought and action, one in character. So God is showing or explaining, I am one, mm. I am united, us, us. But now when we get and in, move into the New Testament, we're really going to start Sister to Sister Shelley, that. I have a problem. Uh, sometimes people tell me, no, uh, the plural form Elohim has nothing to do with plurality. But there is one text that usually people do not think about to tell us that Elohim really, it's a plural. Uh, when we go to the book of Ruth, uh -huh. you remember when um, Naomi tried to tell Ruth, please go back to your nation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have nothing to seek from me. I don't, I don't have any, any sons anymore. And then Ruth said something is, your Elohim is my Elohim. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, Naomi said to Ruth, go to your, El to your uh, nation, to your people, and to your Elohim. Mm. But Ruth, sa Ruth said, no, your Elohim yes. is my Elohim. Do, do you see, we have in two texts, we have plural form, Elohim meant gods, those pagan gods, but now Ruth says, no, you are Elohim, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is plural form, well, never... which actually refers to one God is actually my Elohim, yes, not yeah. Elohim that I belong, which are actually many gods. Yeah. I've never considered that, that yeah. text. Yeah, that's and, a good and, and there is something, uh, there is something else. When we read about those pagan gods, uh, gods of the nations that surrounded Israel, all those gods were always involved in fighting with each other. Yes. Jealousy, trying to put each other, you, you, know, you know what we're talking about. This fa familiar concept also among ancient Greeks. But when Moses said, here Israel, your Elohim is one, it really brings to that, to that unity of the Godhead, the concept that was completely foreign to those surrounding nations. Mm -hmm. Now it, it makes very clear to that New Testament concept, who does not have love, cannot understand God because God is love. Yes. Yeah. If God is love, you don't demonstrate a love toward nothing. You, it has to be more than one person in order that that love is manifested yes. and, and, and displayed. Mm -hmm. I liked one of the points that David Ashrick brought out was that in the beginning when God created man in his image, he didn't just create man, but he created man and woman, told him to go f and be fruitful and multiply. So God created the family was what he created in his image because God was a family, the three that were one, and he created man and woman told them, now that they're married, the two flesh shall become one, go be fruitful and multiply. So the, the family unit is really what is 
the image of God. Mm. Actually, among, among Christians, there are d debate about the image of God. And people may say, how does God look? God looks like human beings. That's not the point. When we go to verse 27, it says, God created man in his image. Male and female, mm -hmm. he created them. So male and female <coughs> reflect God's image. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. It's the characteristics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a warning for bachelors, you know. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's go to the New Testament. Okay. You see, we are dealing here with problematic texts, but we see that those texts, they have much de deeper meaning that we see there on the surface. Matthew 28, we, we must start with this. When Jesus gave that great commission, go and baptize all the nations in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'd like us that we notice something. To baptize in the name. Singular. Not names. Mm -hmm. One name. But that one name reflects three persons. The Father, the Son, mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit, which is in plural. Yes. Okay. Can you help me to understand something? So Jesus said, go and baptize in one name. That's one name. Mm -hmm in the name of the Father and the Son, and some force, some power. <laughs> if the first two are persons, then the third one must be the person, because they are all, they have one name. But I have a question for you. Since he said one name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is it wrong to say, you sometimes hear people baptize in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Is that Actually, an accurate way? Actually, it is that statement that resented people or the Trinity, because with that statement, actually recently I, I watched the baptism, I'm baptizing you in the name of God Father, in the name of God Son, in the name of God the Holy Spirit. We are making three gods. Mm. Okay. It's correct, in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are, we are dealing with one God, mm. but three persons. Okay. Mm -hmm. I believe, and sometimes people, and I understand, and I would like to say to the viewers, that so many times we resist to something, not because of the Bible, because what we hear from the people, I would like to challenge them. Uh, if we have a problem with the people, Let's not reject the biblical teaching Amen. because yes. of what, peop what people make. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, so the next one is the apostolic benediction. My, one of my favorite scriptures. <laughs> the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is given by a person. The love of God by the person. Okay? And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit Amen. is by some force. Mm. No. No, 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 no. It must be the person. Yes. I want us to be very objective. Is there? Let, let's go to the next one. It's distribution of the gifts in the church. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And we need to give that scripture reference. This is 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. 4 through 6. There are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. It's a reference to Jesus Christ. And there are varieties of facts by the same God who works all these things in all persons. Mm. But, but now we go to verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as He wills. I mean, if we just see this text, it's very hard. I must have a great faith to say the first two are persons, the third one is not the person, he's just a kind of, of force or, or power. Yeah. Especially, I'm sorry, sorry. Um, go ahead. But um, even the word dis, dis, distributing, which is a volitional act, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it's done by will yes. to make that distribution. It's not just a force, but it's someone decided to give those gifts to those individuals. And, and spirit here is the antecedent to he, so okay. it's talking about it is the spirit. He is spirit. the one who mm -hmm. is this distributing is according as he wills. Mm -hmm. So, so it thing. comes from God, from, from the Godhead, but actually this Holy Spirit makes distribution in the church. Mm -hmm. I see that the time is flying fast, so I would like to go a little bit for, uh, faster because there is not too much co comment, but the texts are obvious. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4 to, 4 to 6. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. There is one body mm -hmm. and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, 
one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all. Is this clearly three persons? Mm. The next one, Jude 20, 21. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourself in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Mm -hmm. So, praying in the Holy Spirit, in love of God, and in the mercy of, of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Can we separate one is for another one persons? Another one. The, the same three persons are found in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 4 to 6. And I will not go now re and read these, these verses. We have the same at the baptism of Jesus, etc., etc. I just wanted to show some sample, sample text there. Okay. The, May I ask please, one thing? Please. You keep saying um, this shows it's not just a force but a person because throughout the New Testament, as we really see the, the personality of the Holy the Spirit. Spirit revealed, what we see is that He, well, and even in the Old Testament, but we see the omniscience, that He's all-knowing, that He's omnipotent, He's all-powerful, and that He's omnipresent, that He's everywhere. But there are people who will, I had a lady talk to me who was an anti-Trinitarianism, uh, and she said, um, well, how can a spirit be a person. And I said, that's interesting. And I said, what does the Bible say God is? Mm -hmm. She said, love. <laughs> and I said, well, but, but Jesus said, God is spirit and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So if God is spirit and we say that a spirit can't be a person, are you saying that God's not a person? Now she couldn't answer that. Yeah. <laughs> but there are people who try to make the Holy Spirit, they try to mm. deny His personality, mm. deny His divinity, and say He is just a force. He is only the Spirit of the Father or the, an ethereal spirit being. Actually, I would like us to come to the Holy Spirit okay. because evidently people have the most issues with, with this. Okay. You see, um, the, the historic Christianity, based on this text, they really um, developed teaching within those Christological controversies of the 4th and the 5th century, defining God as one substance and the three persons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But after that, the Christianity went completely different ways. So of that concept, one substance, three persons, they really made three gods. Mm. So when people are talking about the Trinity, they usually go point to what Christianity did throughout the century, distort that, can I say, that, that, that teaching. When did that start happening, when it got distorted? During, during the medieval period, scholastic theology la later, okay. etc. Mm -hmm. et mm -hmm. But the early Christianity, uh, from the very moment, they had the right. When, when they referred to the three persons, they meant that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one in the essential divinity, but as persons, they were completely distinct. Mm. By the way, in the book, the Ministry of Healing, I have a very similar statement. It says, they are one in purpose, in mind, in character, but not in person. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, we just have to mention here a few things. Is We must be very, very cautious here. The word Trinity must not be confused with the three theism. With three gods. Three That's not what we, are, what we are talking. Christians are not polytheists, believing in three separate gods, but in one God who manifests himself in three persons, and they are all involved in the plan of salvation. Amen. This is one thing we have to Amen. keep in mind. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, when we use the word person with reference to the Godhead, we should not confuse it with human persons. And unfortunately, when people are, are, are talking about the Trinity and disagree with that, they usually identify God as human beings, as mm -hmm. human person and dealing with that. Yeah. No. Um, what seems clear is that the term person or persons points to the distinction within inner being of God himself. Mm. However, now, how repeat the, that because this is something we want to make sure, sure. And, and we can go a little, you can continue on with this teaching yes, yes. a little bit in the second hour, but repeat what you just said there because that's So what really seems clear point. is that the term persons mm -hmm. that we are using with reference to the Godhead points to the distinction within the inner being of God himself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, how those three persons of the Godhead are distinguished personally and yet completely one 
is not revealed to us. Yeah. And this is the problem that I have. I believe that this is a subject that will take uh, quite part of eternity one day that, mm -hmm. that we'll be able to understand. Maybe the Lord will give us some better language. David said something last night that occurred mm -hmm. to me years ago. We are held hostage to our own language, our inability to articulate what's going on in heaven. Oh, Persons exactly. is the best we can do given what we got. Exactly. So and we and we're we held hostage to an inf I mean, a finite mind. We have such limitations. Oh. It's just like when, you, when you're studying, you find out that there's no time in heaven. I mean, yeah. time was created at the time of the earth. And mm. even now, we have our scientists are believing that, but our finite mind can't grasp these things. So when you're talking about this is really exciting to me. Sister, that, Sister Shirley, uh, I know that my wife is watching. She said, I will not miss that program for anybody. Amen. Yeah. And, and my wife, actually, uh, this year we are celebrating, boy, we have been for 40 years, we have been married. Praise God. And I know when I met that lady, we fell in love with, with each other and we got married. According to the book of Genesis, we became one, one. flesh. Mm -hmm. But believe me, we are two. <laughs> my wife and myself, we are so different. We love each other. And my wife, my wife supports me in everything. But we are two different, different persons. So you see, this is the problem with us. When we talk about God, mm -hmm. as soon as we, we say God is one, but three persons, right. we immediately identify God with us. Yeah. Yes. Because we, as human beings, we cannot be one. Right. We are still, still, still mm -hmm. different. So you use an illustration of an egg. Share that with us. Okay. I wanted to have a PowerPoints and I couldn't, be, I have several illustrations. A boy came home from a Sunday school, it happened in another church, and he was so angry. And the father said, what's the problem? He says, I'm completely confused. I will not go back to Sunday school any longer. The father said, why? He said, the teacher confused me. Three is one and one is three. And I don't understand it. And father said, oh boy, what shall I do? You want to help your child. And finally he got the idea, he had to the fridge and he took an egg and he brought to his son and he said, son, how many items I have in my, he said one, are you sure? Dad, is one, that's what I see. And the father took the egg and, and he had, you know, the shell, and he had yolk and the egg white there. He says, son, can you count how many things are there? He said, dad, it's three. I said, you said one. Yes. But, they consider, but when you put those three elements together, yes. of course, it's, this is an imperfect illustration. Mm -hmm. But it's telling us, even atom, I have another illustration, atom. There are things in this world that explain us that you can have three things, but when they are so together that actually you see only one, one thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But there are still three. Actually, people normally do not have a problem with God the Father. Mm -mm. Because when the prophets saw him in the vision, he is usually presented in anthropomorphic language, mm -hmm. like a human being. People don't have problem. We don't have problem with Jesus Christ because he came and he became flesh. Yes. But Sister Shelley, well, as you mentioned, the problem that people have is with the Holy Spirit. They have a hard time to understand, to grasp the idea that actually the Holy Spirit is a person. And that's why they reach the conclusion that the Holy Spirit is a, a, some sort of impersonal force or divine power issuing from God the Father. And I'd like, I don't know how much time we have, I'd like us to go to some biblical text. And please okay. allow me. Sure. I will go to my favorite one. And even if we do not have any more time to go to any other biblical text, I, I believe that this text is enough from the Gospel of John chapter 14. Okay. <laughs> okay. We know the text. Who would like to read? Okay. John 14, 14 16. 16 to 17. Oh, yes. John 14, 16, 16 to 17. 17. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, okay. Heraclitus, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, mm -hmm. because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Amen. Okay, just to, confu to confuse out of you, it says, a little bit with Greek. I don't like to refer to Greek, but sometimes it's important and it helps. Another helper that you read, or other version says another comforter or another helper, 
Some versions, they have another advocate. Mm -hmm. Actually, in Greek, the word is alos, A-L-L-O-S, mm -hmm. parakletos, P-A-R-A-K-L-E-T-O-S, alos parakletos. Maybe at the first glance, it means nothing to us. But I'd like to start with the second word, parakletos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, you know, you know, people who are bilingual and they speak several languages, they know that sometimes, for instance, in English you have one word and there is no parallel word, for instance, in Spanish or my Croatian language. Yes. You cannot. I have to take few words to explain. Yes. Mm -hmm. The same is about the word parakletos. The word consists of two parts, para, which means by or beside, mm -hmm. and kletos, which means called. When Paul says, Paul called to be apostles. It's actually the word kletos is used. So then what is the meaning of the word parakletos? It means somebody who is called to stand by somebody. Mm -hmm. So I cry, I, 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 I have terrible time. The person comes to comfort me. He's yeah. my parakletos. He stands by, uh, beside me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I stumble under the heavy uh, burden the person comes to help me with that load, with that, with that burden. He's my parakletos. But the word was used in the first century also for advocate. You go to the court room there before the judge. Boy, I was two times because of some traffic. I, I, wanted, I wanted to fight <laughs> for, 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 to save a few dollars, you know, and points. Boy, I was completely lost. I did not know what to say. And suddenly a person stood beside me. He was my parakletos. He said everything on behalf of me. Suddenly I became wise. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, when we go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, you know the text. But before you go to, Please. to 1 John, start right here for a second on the another. We only have a few seconds left in this, but the emphasis here that I love is Jesus is saying it's another Pericletus. Can we leave it for after the break? Let's leave that one for after because the it, break. Because it is important. Mm -hmm. It, this it is, is important. You see, uh, uh, um, we have in 1 John chapter 1, Jesus is called the as Parakletos. Yes. I'm using yes. the original yes. word. So who is really Parakletos? It's Jesus. Right. Then the Holy Spirit is another Parakletos. If Jesus is a person as Parakletos, then what about Holy Spirit? Amen. Amen. Be the same. So we're going to have to just tease <laughs> our viewers with that because we are going to have to take a break here in just a moment. But this is a live program. And if you have any questions, we're going to let the good doctor continue on in the second hour. If you have any questions, you can call us at 618-627-4651 or or email us at live at 3abn.org, and we're going to come back and get into this a little bit deeper. And I have surprise about Parakletos oh, when we come back. Oh, this is yes, yes. I love this. <laughs> so, CA, this is pretty exciting stuff, isn't it? Oh, it's good stuff. Good stuff. And I think I know where you're heading, and we're right along with you, man. This is good. So, get a drink of water, do what you have to do, be back here in two minutes and two seconds. We'll be right back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Welcome back to 3ABN Live. And if you are just joining us in this second hour, tonight we have with us Dr. Ronko Stavanovic from Andrews University. And we are tackling the topic of our triune God. And right now, before we went to break, we were beginning to talk about the deity of the Holy Spirit. And we really just want to kind of pick up here, don't we, CA? Mm -hmm, we do. And um, we've been talking about particularly John 14, 16, and 17, when Jesus said that he would pray the Father to send us another paracletos, another comforter, another helper, an advocate, someone to stand by us. So 
you are going to make the point that from 1 John two. chapter 2 and verse 1, that Jesus is called our paraclete. Let's keep in mind that both 1 John and the Gospel of John was written by the same person. Mm -hmm. Right. So in 1 John, he refers to Jesus as paracletos. But in the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit is the second, another paracletos. Mm -hmm. And so it, 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 it tells us, so the Holy Spirit is designated by Jesus to be another paracletos because he fills Christ's place in the world while Christ is not in the world mm -hmm. in, his, in, his, in his absence. So this is very important. Is if Jesus is paracletos and he promised another paracletos, is this a kind of force or impersonal power? But you know, so many times we... Um, are engaged in debates of doctrinal, you know, debates, etc. Mm -hmm. But I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm an ordained pastor. I like to always try to help my students as we are dealing with the doctrine and sometimes exegesis of the text. We have to learn something about ourselves. Mm. And I try to find a lesson from these paracletos. When I was a little boy, um, we didn't have too much. Was so, your father a pastor? Uh, no, my father became Seventh-day Adventist when I, were, I was one year old, and my father died last year after mm. being Seventh-day Adventist for 60 years. Oh. Oh. Actually, I visited him just a short time before he died. He couldn't move. He was very, very, very weak. Mm. But the last song that we were singing, it was about the promise of the second coming of Christ. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. kissed each other, that we'll see each other, Jesus comes. He oh, died in that faith. Uh, I grew up in faithful Seventh-day Adventist family. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. And I tried to learn something. My mother, she had a garden, and tomatoes is my favorite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I noticed as a child what my mother did. She would put a tomato plant in the ground. And you know, that plant starts growing and becomes, you know. After that, you have those small green balls and they're starting growing. They, they start to, to be red. You know, and I noticed something with the plant that, you know, that plant is there. It goes down. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do something, you just have yes. rotten tomatoes. I remember my mother, my father prepared it. She would take stick. She would take a paracletos, put it there beside that plant, tied it together. And it was because of that paracletos that that plant was straight and we had tomatoes. So without that, the, without the paracletos of the stick by the tomato plant, no tomatoes. The, it, it, it couldn't be fruitful. I mean, it could be fruitful, but it didn't really go anywhere. And it's the same with us. We think without that the Holy Spirit. without the Holy Spirit, He's the one who stands us up for service. He's the one who stands us up mm. to, to obey the Lord. He's the one who stands us up fills our heart with his love so that we can walk in the footsteps Sister Shelley, of Jesus. Sister Shelley, and much more. Yes. We even cannot carry all that fruit, yes. good fruit that we have on <laughs> ah, us. That's a powerful point. You see, we have talents. You have great talents for the, for the ministry. Without the Holy Spirit, mm. under the weight of those talents, good things that you are doing for the Lord, you become proud, you know. Absolutely. You simply become mm -hmm. rotten That's tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You and me, who, whoever mm -hmm. of us. It's only with the Holy Spirit that we can survive as a Christian. That's why it's so much important to know that the Holy Spirit is a person. He holds us straight. He's always by us, yes. keeping us straight there Amen. to do the will of God. Mm -hmm. This is a powerful statement. That's without Holy Spirit, we cannot do yes. anything. Yes. Now we are coming to that word, another mm -hmm. paracletos. Actually, again, we have to go to Greek. We saw that the word... Alos, A-L-L-O-S used. But in Greek language, there are two words for other or another. Mm -hmm. The first word is heteros. The viewers are familiar with that word. We talk about heterosexual okay. marriage. Okay. What does it mean, heterosexual? When you have two different persons, male and female, mm -hmm. they join together in a marriage. That's why that marriage is heterosexual, different marriage. But alos, so heteros means another of completely different kind. Yes. Mm. Another word that is, that is in Greek, uh, 
for other or another is the word alos that Jesus used with reference to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Actually, it means other or another of the same kind. Ooh, I'm, I'm taking notes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like this. So which this word did Jesus use? Yeah. He used the word alos. alos. I will send to you another paracletos who is of the same kind can I say, of the same rank, of the, of the same substance mm -hmm. as I am. Wow, mm -hmm. that's powerful. That's what, what I tell you. If you just have this text, we don't need to go any further yeah. in, the, in the New Testament. It's clear that the Holy Spirit must be as person as Jesus is. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is powerful. By the way, please allow me to read the statement. Um, from the book of Evangelism, Evangelism, page 615, it's on page 5 that you have there. The comforter that Christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. Mm -hmm. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great power, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by faith are baptized, and these three powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their effort to live the new life in Christ. Is this clear? Amen. Amen. And the statement to emphasize is there are three living persons of the heavenly trio, yeah. and this is something that is totally substantiated by the Bible. We don't need interpretation to this. No. Of the Bible. No, we don't. Actually, we know that, that, that uh, within the Godhead, each one of the three persons, they have certain role. And, and um, evidently that the Holy Spirit has the role of the executor. Mm -hmm. He is the one who works the, the, the decisions of the Godhead in, in, in human lives. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk more about that. This is our best understanding that we have. Anything more, I'm afraid to say, to say you, you, it will be superfluous. When we go to the Bible, the attributes of the Holy Spirit are the attributes of God. He is omnipresent. Psalm 139, 7 to 10, he's omniscient. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 2, 10 mm -hmm. to 11. These are all the attributes of God. Yes. But, but I will go to something further. I would like to see how in many biblical texts, the Holy Spirit and God are used interchangeably. For instance, if you talk to me and say, and you, professor, as a teacher there in the seminary, so professor and the teacher, are the same? Means one, the same thing. Yes. We call, we call it actually parallelism. Mm -hmm. For instance, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 2 and 3, we are going to the Old Testament. He says, the first line, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. That's the first line. But the second line, parallel is the first one. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. Mm -hmm. so, so this shows actually the Spirit of God. It's actually God himself. Yes. The Spirit of the Lord is the God of Israel. So it but I know viewers say, say ah, but let's go to a more clear text. Okay. The book of Acts, chapter 5, we know when that couple yes, yes. lied. I use all we the know time. that. We know that. And Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? But I will skip the text. When we go to the end of verse 4, it says, you have not lied to man, but to God. So, and so he clearly... The beginning said, you lie to the Holy Spirit. The conclusion, you lie to God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Do but, we need, do we need any, any comment to that? Mm. Also, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, 22, we saw it. The same Spirit works, but in verse 28, it's God who appoints, it's God who works those ministries, different ministries in the church. Amen. But, but something more. In the book of Acts, chapter 28, we have the statement of Paul. He said, the Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah, the prophet, to your the father. One more time. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah. But when we go to Isaiah, the quotation that we have here is Isaiah 6, 8 to 10. In Isaiah it says, this is what Yahweh said. Mm. What Jehovah God says. Yes. The Lord. So the Holy Spirit is Yahweh. Oh, yes. 
this part. Or the powerful text. Or for instance, in Hebrews chapter 10, 15 to 17, we have the quotation from Jeremiah 31, 32 to 33. Mm -hmm. And in Hebrews we read, and the Holy Spirit also testified to us. But in Jeremiah, this is what Yahweh, the Lord says. Mm. So th the New Testament writers are continually quoting from the Old Testament what Yahweh says, and they say the, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit clearly spoke to us. Another thing is, parallels between 2 Peter 1.21, we know 1.21 Peter, mm -hmm. for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but man moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. When we go to 2 Timothy 3.16, all the scripture is inspired by God. By God. Mm -hmm. so Holy Spirit, God. And you know, sometimes people miss this parallelism because they're not really studying. Study and if we, don't, if we don't study, we are going to uh, catch ourselves in such a place that when Jesus said that even the very elect could be fooled, I believe that if we don't study to show ourselves approved and really get into the Word and understand it for ourselves, we can be deceived because there are people who have been deceived by the anti-Trinitarianism teachings out there. They'll get, as we talked earlier in the first hour, if you've got these hundred texts that all line up perfectly showing mm -hmm. the plurality but the unity of God, and there's just a couple that are out of that alignment, they're problematic texts, then, see, some people grab hold of those two problematic ones, yeah. And they try to make that a doctrine, and if people don't know for themselves, they can be fooled. Okay, Sister Shelley, can you help me? We are the temple of? The Holy, Holy Spirit. Yeah. Let's see. Temple of God. The, se the, Holy the same Spirit. Apostle Paul, in two different letters, is it? Yeah, two letters, written to Church Corinth. Let's see what he writes. Okay. First Corinthians 6, 19. Mm -hmm. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But then he repeats that statement in 2 Corinthians 6, 16. We are the temple of the living God. God. Amen. Yes. So is the Holy Spirit God? Mm. <laughs> it, Amen. It's, it's so obvious there. See, the problem is that the Holy Spirit never manifests himself in, in visible form. As we have the, about God the Father, as we have about Jesus Christ. But whenever the Holy Spirit is manifested, it's always fire, wind, and the baptism of Jesus, it is, it is a dove. But generally, he does not assume any visible form. When there is a visible form, it's like fire, wind, wind, or, or a dove. Now, let me stop here for a while. So is the Holy Spirit only in the New Testament? Mm. No. Actually, I, I, I really, we, I see that f the time is flying so fast. We have Genesis 1-2, at the very creation, we have mm -hmm. the presence of the Holy Spirit. In Genesis 6-3, we, we see God said, My spirit shall not strive forever with these people, you know, before the flood. Oh, yes. We see in the Old Testament, he equips certain individuals to perform special tasks. Gideon was empowered by the Holy Spirit, and, and they did. We, we have that the Holy Spirit um, left Saul, and then evil spirit came, came there. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit speaks through the prophets, it's so much. But let's go to another note. We have to admit that the, any description of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is very, very vague. Mm -hmm. We don't have too many, too many references. Mm -hmm. When the Holy Spirit equips people for special task and ministry, it's really a privilege of a small number of people. Yes. It was. However, we go to the New Testament. What was a privilege advantage of just few people in the Old Testament times? Actually, it's a privilege of the community of the believers, of all believers, of all Christians who follow Jesus Christ. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. I just had a thought that... Um, Actually, I've been thinking about this, but not, I can't articulate it. I haven't studied this out. But the thought occurred to me actually last week that when God created Adam and Eve, He actually came down and walked in the garden with them, and they, they spent time together. Now, after man sinned and he, when God instituted the temple, God came down in the tabernacle, and He was in the Holy of Holies. So 
the Holy Spirit at that time, God's presence, he, they, he said, let man make a, a tabernacle for me that I may dwell with men. So God was still coming down. His presence was there. Mm -hmm. But now in the New Testament, when after Christ had appeared, we had God with us, Emmanuel, God with us. But when Christ went back up to heaven, then he had to send the Holy it's Spirit. Fantastic. It's now fantastic. we're the living temple. So the reason the Holy Spirit, would you maybe agree no, with no, this? It's fantastic. The reason fantastic. the Holy Spirit didn't indwell the people of the Old Testament, the reason we just see him kind of, if you will, lighting on them for special service or, or doing things, is because God's presence was there, but now the Holy Spirit is God's presence. We're the temple. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, does that make no, sense? No, 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 it makes sense. It's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. And then add to that the fact that the Holy Spirit, Christ said of the Holy Spirit, He will not testify of Himself. It's no. not His job to yes. promote Himself. He's going to promote me. Amen. And the, yeah. the work that I did. Um, actually, I know that some viewers are struggling with that, and I just want to tell you, I struggled myself. Oh, we all. When I was a young pastor, I struggled with the concept of Trinity, and there is one thing that evidently helps. Take the the Bible and study for yourself. Amen. That's what I did. And I came to one text with reference to this problem. And please, I don't know who would like to read the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 39. 39. This is a well, well, well-known text. Okay, but this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, mm -hmm. because Jesus was not yet glorified. Even though the Holy Spirit had... oh. That's, that's you can, you can go, you can go, read it. Okay, I'll read the note. Okay. It says, even though the Holy Spirit had worked with the human beings since the entrance of sin, His work was not manifested in its fullness. That happened after the death of Jesus on the cross and His post-resurrection. So when was Jesus actually glorified? When He was raised. On the day of Pentecost, after His death on the cross, when He ascended there to the heavenly yes. places. Mm -hmm. Then the Holy Spirit came. And now I would like to talk about why then the Holy Spirit is so mysterious during the Old Testament times. I would like something to say, probably uh, some of viewers will be surprised, but this is very biblical. In the Old Testament times, the planet Earth was the territory of Satan, his kingdom. You remember that Jesus yes, called yes. Uh, Satan the, the ruler of this, this world, world yeah. three times. In the, in, the, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, um, Satan comes to Jesus in tempting him three times. He said, hey, if you fall down and worship me, I will give all these things to you because it has been given to me. Jesus did not say, hey, you liar, it has never been given to, to, to you. Mm -hmm. Actually, Satan was really the ruler of this world. Yes. How did he get it? Of course, by stealing from Adam, from Adam. but he yeah. was. So the Holy Spirit worked like, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the expression, like underground in somebody else's kingdom. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's why we don't have so much explicit reference to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But when Jesus died on the cross, what did he do on the cross? He redeemed the planet Earth from yes, Satan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then, according to the New Testament, Jesus ascended there to the heavenly places. There was an enthronement ceremony there. Mm -hmm. How did it look? I don't know. But it was then, according to the New Testament, Jesus sat on the heavenly throne at the right hand of the Father. It is at that moment that Satan ceased to be the ruler of the planet Earth. Right, that's the statement. Now the ruler of this world is king. If, if we go to chapter 12, yes. is, is now the kingdom and authority and the power of God. I believe that really Revelation chapter 4 and 5 portrays, portrays that event. Mm. It is on the day of Pentecost when Jesus became enthroned. Now we have that the Holy Spirit came down to the earth into Jesus' territory, into Jesus' kingdom, <laughs> to help the spread, to, to spread. I know some people have the problem with this, but I would like us, Sister uh, Shelley, mm -hmm. can you read on page 7 uh, this uh, statement from Acts of the Apostles, page 38 and 39? Absolutely. Acts of the Apostles, page 38 and 39. 39. Christ's ascension to heaven was the signal that his followers were to receive the promised blessing. For this they were to wait before they entered upon their work. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he was enthroned amidst the adoration of the angels. Can you repeat one more time? Because I know there are some viewers, they heard that 
about enthronement of Christ, the day of Pentecost, it's invention of some people. Okay. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he was enthroned amidst the adoration is of this the clear? angels. That mm -hmm. is clear. As soon as this ceremony was completed, as soon as this ceremony, ceremony enthronement was completed, was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents, mm. and Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. Amen. According to his promise, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had, as priest and king, received all authority in heaven and on earth, and was the anointed one over his people. Why the Holy That's Spirit clear. on the day of Pentecost? Yes. Amen. Okay, well, let's clear up, because I know the viewers will now be confused. So what about people during the Old Testament times? They did not have the Holy Spirit. Well, let's keep in mind that people cannot be saved, people cannot be converted without the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So let me assure the viewers, according to the Old Testament, every person in the Old Testament time experienced that, that influence and the working power of the Holy Spirit in life. We are not talking about that. We are talking about the Holy Spirit empowering people for the service and the ministry. Mm -hmm. yes. That was a privilege only a few in, here and there, some individuals. Mm -hmm. But with the coming of the Holy Spirit, all the body of the believers, all Christians are now empowered. Amen. Yeah. What was Glory the, to What God. was the privilege of all? Please, I know the time. Can I just take a few minutes sure. just to go very fast to see if really the Holy Spirit is a person? How Jesus referred to him okay. as a person? Number one is, I'm talking about page seven. I would like to finish, finish with that. Okay. The Holy Spirit refers to himself as I. Okay. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, where is that? While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, yes. set apart for me mm -hmm. Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Is, yes. that, is that some that kind of force really of power? Mm -hmm. It's the book of Acts chapter 13 verse 2. In 1 John chapter 2 verse, verse uh, 24, it says, God is the Spirit. The problem that people have is, I have to mention it, that in Greek, the word pneuma, it's a neuter. Mm. And many people are confused and people, some people know to take advantage of that. We have to understand that the word pneuma is not invented for the Holy Spirit. It's a standard word for the Spirit in Greek language. So when you have the standard word for the Spirit, it's used also for the Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit. However, Whenever reference we have to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, he's never it. Mm -hmm. yes. It's always he. Yeah. And in the in, uh, um, Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse, verse 24, God is the Spirit, neuter, numa. But we never assume that God is it. it. Yeah. He is he. And Jesus said, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So even though we have the neuter form, the Holy Spirit is always he. And I'm going really now very, very fast. When Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14, he says, he will be with you always. The world does not know him. him. He will abide with you. He will teach you all the things. Mm -hmm. He will remind you all that I said to you. That I said to you. Just a moment. He will testify about me. If I do not go, the Paracletos will not come to you. He will guide you into all the truth. Mm -hmm. He will not speak on his own own, but who, whatever he hears, he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me. Is that enough? Mm -hmm. So Jesus over and over refers to the he, Holy Spirit as, he. as a person. I just want to comment just a second on that last, he will glorify me. Please. That's the beauty of the unity when it says in, in the Hebrew, when it said that the Lord our God is Echad, the one the beauty of that is that, as you said, in the Old Testament, the polytheism, all of these gods were warring with one another, or the supposed gods. They were always some kind of things. But what we see with our monotheism, 
theistic approach to God with one God is that Jesus said, I only do what the Father show, tells me to do. I only speak what he says. So Jesus was always doing to glorify the Father. And now he says, the Holy Spirit's not going to, he says he's not going to speak on his own. He's going to glorify me. So there's no competition no. among the Godhead. And Sister Shelley, do you notice? It is God the Father who sent Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, in John chapter 12, Jesus says, the Father will send now the Holy Spirit. In the same way as he, as he sent the Son, now he sent the Holy Spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's so obvious there. We have something more. Is We have in the book of Acts chapter 15, 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and, and to us. Is it? It is good to some power and to us. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> no. You have to put everything as, 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 as persons. Amen. Also, Jesus stated that any word against Jesus will be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. In the New Testament, you can do blasphemy only against God. Yes. Amen. And if blasphemy will be forgiven against Jesus, he's the person, so the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven because the Holy Spirit is a person. And just one minute to conclude it. Okay. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit speaks explicitly. He speaks. He expresses emotions. Mm. He intercedes. Together with the church, he makes a call to come to Christ. The Holy Spirit can grieve, Ephesians 4.30, Isaiah 64.10. He can be insulted. He distributes the spiritual gifts. He forbids. He sends people to the mission field. He makes uh, elders in the church. He speaks to the seven churches. And please let me conclude with the book of evangelism. Mm -hmm. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. Amen. Let me conclude with this. So now the question is, we can say much more. Is, is the plurality of the Godhead biblical? And we're just touching, this touching, is just, just touching. the tip of the iceberg that we're seeing yes. here tonight. But there's so much biblical evidence that the Holy Spirit is a person. There's so much biblical evidence that he has all the attributes and characteristics of God and that he has the same emotion, he has will, he, uh, he does things of his own volition. Yeah. So we see throughout the Bible that God is one, but there's an expression of God. There's three persons of God. I have a question and you know how, for you. And you know how many texts we, 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 we skipped. skipped. Yeah. I but know. Can I just make final statement? Surely. Does it really matter? Oh, I think it does. Yes. Let yes, me ask does. you, does it matter that I live in my house with a person or with kind of robot or the things? Does it matter? Yes. Mm. You see, the Holy Spirit is a person, he can be grieved, he can be insulted, Yes. He, 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 he can simply depart from me. But if the Holy Spirit is the power, then I can use that power, manipulate with that power, do whatever I want. But the Holy Spirit is God, he wants me, yeah. he wants to save me. And as a God, I have to be careful how I relate to him. Boy, so it matters. Believe me, it matters. Yes. You just said something that really struck a chord with me, that if we look at the Holy Spirit only as a power, then we're using him and we can't use God. We've got to look at him as the person who dwells within us, the paraclete who stands beside us, our advocate, our comforter, our helper. And he, we are to yield to his control. We are to be in submission to God. We and cannot he him works control. through us. Amen. And sister, sister Shelley, something, something more. I will, I, this is really final. We Seventh-day Adventists, mm -hmm. and I know many Protestants in the United States, we are wait, waiting for the special coming of the Holy Spirit, special work of the Holy Spirit in the final day. It's called as the latter rain. Amen. Mm -hmm. I am afraid, and I will say to the viewers, I'm addressing you, there is somebody in this world who would like to remove this biblical truth from, from us. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because very soon we will witness a special manifestation of the working power of the Holy Spirit among yeah. us. Yes. And there is somebody who would like to deny it in our lives. And no wonder, no wonder, Mm -hmm. why the consequences 
of rejecting the Holy Spirit as a person has a terrible consequences. Yes. Amen. Yes. I think that okay. I ha we've got a lot of questions uh, here. We just, Renko, thank you so much <laughs> for for touching on these things and just kind of stirring the pot a little, if you will. <laughs> but I know you've got a lot of questions. I've got a fistful of questions over here. But actually, David Ashrick, when he finished his presentation, he came over. And here's what it says. Ronko? He's putting me in the trouble. He's putting okay. you in the hot seat. <laughs> Thank you, David. This is a great question. Ronko, you are an expert on the book of Revelation. Could you comment on the false trinity found there? Oh, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to come. <laughs> Actually, one of the central concepts of the last 11 chapters of the book of Revelation, which we called eschatological, it means that that section of the book of Revelation deals specifically with the time of the end. The first half of the book of Revelation really can be titled the Trinity at work. The Trinity is introduced in Revelation chapter 1, verses 2, 6, then chapters 4 and 5. But then when we go to chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, the title can be the counterfeit Trinity at work. Actually, we have Satan introduced in Revelation chapter 12. Mm -hmm. And then we have those two beasts who are associates of Satan there in the final battle. Satan really functions as the organ, as, as a counterfeit of God. While the first beast in the book of Revelation, I would advise readers to find my commentary. This is a little bit commercial, okay? But that's okay. That I, I have about 10 pages there. You can see the language, how the first beast is portrayed is the language of Jesus Christ. While the second beast, the language that is used to describe the second beast, the, 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 the earth beast, it's actually the language of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Just to say, to open the appetite, and when we uh, have that series on the book of Revelation, we will talk about that much, much more. Yes, and I just have to, I'll, I'll put a plug in here that Ronco is coming back. Uh, he'll be back twice this year to be taping a series called The Revelation of the Coming King, and that's going to be based on your book, book. The Revelation of a revelation of Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, which is an excellent commentary. I have both editions. I have to say I prefer the second, second. edition. It's uh, really, in my opinion, it really sunk you know, in You know, work. Sister Shelley, and both of you, your authors, you write something, and it's clear to you. And re people read it, and say, but when people start reading, then people see something else that you never notice. Mm -hmm. And there was a need to really clarify those things. Yes. And I'm so grateful to the readers to, that pointed to me to that, that we were able to provide the second edition of that commentary. Um, here's a question, and it says, How do you explain when Jesus was bringing the Holy Spirit upon the disciples in the upper room? Was that a Holy Spirit of Jesus' power, or was that a third person? I think it was the power of Jesus. It, yes. Um, actually, we ha no. when we go to the book of Genesis, we see when God created Adam um, uh, and the first human couple, what did he, he put his spirit into them, they became mm -hmm. alive. Jesus announced the coming of the Holy Spirit. The disciples were completely dead. They were paralyzed by Jesus' death. So now Jesus, in symbolic act of doing, telling them, receive the Holy Spirit that I'm sending, he simply reflected symbolically to the book of Genesis. He wanted to make his disciples to be alive, to equip them for the ministry. The same Jesus said to his disciples, now you will stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes to you. So here Jesus makes a symbolic act, mm. which does not have the real significance because the Holy Spirit really came later at the day of Pentecost. So, but then what this uh, reader or writer is saying is that when Jesus brought the Holy Spirit upon the disciples in the upper room, they thought that that was just the power of Jesus, not a third person. No, no. But the one who showed up in the upper room as a body of flame and then separated into tongues of fire, do you believe that was just a power or was no, that the no, Holy no, no, Spirit? No, 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 no. Yes, okay. it was Jesus' power because the Holy Spirit came to bring Jesus' power, but the Holy Spirit is a person. person. Okay. This okay. Is Sorry for... for for helping me to clarify it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of the questions I have, we have actually touched on. Um, 
Uh, this one we've kind of we've kind of dealt with too, and I'm trying to find something new. Shelley, maybe you can help me out. Well, this there? this one we touched on, but uh, Squash Blossom has written <laughs> and said, if each member of the Godhead are three persons, is there a text that explains the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit? Yes, I refer Psalms. to that. Yes. Can can I? Surely, can I just that's in Psalm. To find it? It? I think yes. it's 129 Psalm. Yeah. Actually, we have uh, two texts that refer us to God. Actually, Psalm 139, 7 to 10, he's omnipresent. Where can I flee from the Holy Spirit? Amen. If I go there, he's there. If I go there, it's the same reference that we have to, to God in general in the Old Testament. Then he's omniscient. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 2 and, uh, to verses 10 to 11, they tell, they're telling us that uh, with the Holy Spirit, there is no any secret mystery because he knows all the depth of the Godhead. Amen. Amen. Now, this is from a question from Stefano. If you, do you have a good question? I don't want to just sit here and read them all. Um, let's see. Um, I'm understand, am I understanding you to say that we should not say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? That's uh, from earlier in, in the first half. And they're asking the question um, that we should not say that. Should we not say that? Because in that case, we are making three gods. Uh -huh. uh, what Jesus stated Go and baptize them in the name, which is singular, one name, mm -hmm. but three persons, they have one name. There are not three names, there are not three gods. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as long as the people have a, a right understanding what it is, I don't want simply to stick to, to the way how we say. Understood. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as, as it is clear to the people, you know, you know, you know mm -hmm. what... what, what the point is. Uh, here's one that comes from uh, Stefano, and he was actually writing in, I should mention this as well, uh, real quick for our free offer so that you still have time to get our free offer, and that is a simple and easy way to study the Bible with others by Don and Marjorie Gray, who were evangelists, and they've been through years of public evangelism and personal soul winning, and they've written this marvelous uh, it's just a short, small book, but it's kind of an A to Z on how to give a great Bible study. That's good. So you can call us at 618-627-4651, or you can email us at freeoffer at 3abn.org, and we will be happy to send this to you. But Stefano has this question. Since God is three persons in one, do we receive the Holy Spirit from God the Father or God the Son? Or does God the Holy Spirit come to us on his own power? Mm. Yeah. Uh, this topic is not really clear in the New Testament. And I, I hope that viewers always are looking for an honest answer, not just something is. We have, Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will send to you. On other place we have like, we have impression that actually Jesus says uh, the spirit that I will send to you. So the fact that Jesus, the Son, as the Father to send, actually it means that He is ascending. Amen. In, in, in that sense. But it is really the Father. He sends the Son, and now He sends the, Hol the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to read this as, I was going to try to edit this, but I'm going to read it as we have it so that you okay, get the, okay, the, the, okay. the flavor. Could your guest please, please explain the connection between the little horn destruction of the three kings, all Aryan nations, non-Trinitarian nations, that his kingdom might arise, his foundation, could it be said, the Council of Nicaea 325 brought us the Trinity defined, the root of all Catholic doctrine, the sacredness of Sunday as a sign of her authority. Um, what connection uh, might we see, if any, here? Honest, I don't see connection. Mm -hmm. I don't see connection with that. I don't see what the Council of Nicaea had, had with those three, because historically the fulfillment of this prophecy, the book of Daniel, came in some later times than the Council of Nicaea. I don't see connection. Mm -hmm. and, and I must say, I have not th been thinking about that. Maybe um, if the viewer can send an email to me, I will look deeper in the text and I can provide the answer. Mm -hmm. But I have not thought of, of, the, of that. Yeah. Now, I've got several here on prayer. Let me just read two of them. It says, usually when I pray, I say, Father, I pray that you will send your Holy Spirit, knowing that there are three 
people in one. So what is a good word to say it? What is the right thing to say when you pray? This one says, since the Holy Spirit is equal, should we also send prayers to the Holy Spirit? Uh, Jesus taught us clearly yes. that when we pray, we pray to Father. Um, I'm surprised that people don't say, can we pray to Jesus? And we under hear the, a lot of people un, who do that. Under mm -hmm. the Protestant uh, uh, theology, etc., et in general tense, emphasis on Jesus' salvation, which is right. Mm -hmm. Actually, people are going to pray Jesus. Actually, we don't have any place in the New Testament that disciples or, or anybody ever pray to Jesus. Amen. We are supposed, but the question necessary, when we say our Father who is in heaven, the Father is the representative of the Godhead. So when we pray to the Father, we really pray to the three persons of the Godhead. Mm. But the Father is in the charge of the plan of, of, the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. And Jesus told us clearly when we pray, really to pray to the Father. What? In, in the name of Jesus. It does not mean necessarily that I always have to mention in the name of Jesus Christ, but it means that because of his death on the cross, yes. Jesus made possible that free approach to the throne of grace mm -hmm. so that we can receive that help at the time of our need when we pray mm -hmm. to the Father. Is it Isaiah 9, 6 where it lists all the name, you know, everlasting prince yes, yeah. and eternal Father? That has always, because it's talking about the Messiah, but one of those names is Eternal Father. All, all those names can be applied to Jesus Christ, yes. can apply to the Holy Spirit. It's, 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 mm -hmm. We don't have time to talk about that. Yes. But it's so, so clear there. When you look at Isaiah's entire uh, portrait of, of, of Christ as eternal, uh, uh, it's really beautiful when you pull it out of Isaiah. It's really wonderful. Thing. There's a question that was in my mind, and I'm having a senior moment. Just why not just that, just that fast. So I, we need to go to a <laughs> well, question. Do you? Yeah, well, I've, I've, got, I've got two questions. I was really holding on to but, it. But I'm it's surprised written. that nobody asked question about Matthew 20, 28, about the Great Commission and the Book of Acts. Do you mm. have that question? Usually, this is what people always I'm ask. I'm sorry, about. I was reading a question about the Great Commission, baptized them in the name. And the question is, how is that we do not have in the book of Acts that the apostles are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Uh, are mm -hmm. you familiar with that yes, question? Yes, I've heard that question as well. Do you want us to answer that question? Please do. Because wherever I go, this is usually the question that people ask. Yeah, yeah. Jesus said, go and baptize the people in the name, one name, mm -hmm. the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The question is, do we have anywhere in the book of Acts that the apostles baptized in the name of the Father? Yes, we have. But the problem is how we understand the phrase of Jesus. You see, we are so legalistic. Yes. When Jesus said, you pray to the Father in my name, if I do not mention in the name of Jesus Christ, I did not obey the command of Jesus. This, mm. Jesus did not mean that every time I have to repeat in the name of, of, of Jesus. What he tried to say, when you pray to the Father, you have to pray on behalf of my authority. Yes. And what I did and make you possible that you can pray to the Father. Mm -hmm. When Jesus said, you will baptize people in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, it means we are supposed to, we must baptize people in Jesus' authority. Mm -hmm. In the book of Acts, people were forgiven, the book of Acts chapter 2, the people were forgiven by God because of what Jesus did for them, they had to receive the forgiveness of sin, washing sin. And then the Peter said, and then when you are baptized, you will receive the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. This is what it means to be baptized in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, not necessarily to repeat always the